those jobs. And then with the school corporation's permission, and again, only with their permission, WD personnel to go into the schools and talk to the students about which of those career paths coming as far as being on an upswing in the future. Um, House Bill 1003 is uh, Representative uh, Gutwein uh, is the author of this bill. I'm proud to say I'm listed as the second co-author. Good thing. This is consolidating and streamlining state government reports. And uh, what this bill basically does, appeal six chapters and 88 sections of Indiana code that are outdated, unused, or duplicative. It also repeals 73 reports that are required by many of our agencies, including 23 reports by IDEM. And that will have an impact on uh, some of our businesses here in Jay County. So this is part of our government reduction. Uh, many of us in the legislature were given the, the charge, find ways that we can reduce state government or find things on the books that we don't need anymore and let's eliminate those. The next topic is uh, House Bill 1005. I was asked about this as people were coming in. This is the Township Consolidation Bill. And I think many of you have heard about that. Uh, so this bill will require small townships and that's defined as townships that have a population or fewer. They will be required to merge with an adjacent township within the same county January 1st, 2023. Approximately, not quite uh, from today, almost five years. And so if this passes, 300, statewide, 313 townships would then be affected. 33, which is part of Jay County, we would have 13 townships that would be impacted here in Jay County. The townships that would be asked, or in essence, if this passes in its current form, would be mandated to consolidate, would include Green Township that have a population of 980, Jackson Township has a population of 953, 760, Knox Township 500, Madison Township 652, Noble Township 636. I think you begin to see the pattern here. Madison and Noble could probably consolidate pretty easily, and yet they would still just barely combined be over the 1,200 in population. Township has 891 people who live in that township, and then Wabash Township, they have 574. So those are the townships within Jay County that according to this legislation would be asked to, uh, mandated to consolidate. We can debate that, talk about it, how you feel. Um, I will tell you, it's kind of, uh, I'm up in the air. On one hand, township government is the government that's closest to people, especially in rural areas. On the other side, I would say that when we eliminated township trustees, we, uh, I'm sorry, township assessors, we allowed you to vote on whether you wanted your township uh, countywide, whether you wanted your assessors to be eliminated at the township level. This is says, you know, maybe we ought to put it on the ballot to, to merge townships, just like we did with township assessors. One final bill, and then uh, we can get to your questions. This is House Bill 1007. And as Travis alluded to, the opioid uh, problem is it's on everyone's, it's on the front screen, it's on their radar. We've got to work on solving this problem. And let me give you first a few statistics. Indiana, we had a 52% increase in opioid deaths just from 2015 to 2016. And in the state of Indiana, 100 Hoosiers die every month from a drug overdose. To give you an idea of the impact that this is having on our state, and that doesn't even begin to scratch the surface when we talk about how it affects our employers uh, and the families of those uh, employees and so on. So in response, House Republicans are proposing to expand opioid treatment programs across the state we're proposing that we provide the funding for nine additional treatment centers. This goal of nine new centers isn't just an arbitrary number. Based on their anticipated location, this would put any Hoosier in the state of Indiana 
within a one hour drive of a treatment center. Um, the bill also will provide licensure flexibility for mental health professionals and will streamline credentialing as well for those mental health professionals. So um, there, and there will certainly be other bills in the House and the Senate that deal with this crisis. This is one of the priority issues, though, uh, of the House Republican Caucus. Uh, uh, let's uh, let's open it up for for your questions or comments. Sure. Let me uh, do one thing. I forgot to do this. Uh, we have two interns here from the Senate who are here volunteering. Since we're uh, this is a little workforce right here. College <laughs> themselves and tell a little bit about themselves, what they're studying, where you come from, and uh, we need to thank them for coming here today. Uh, so, thank you all for coming. I'm Chandler Bell. I'm a major starting about May 6th. So, um, right now I'm, learning, I'm interning at the State House and assisting Senator Holman. And if there's any questions we can answer, please let us know. Patterson, again, thank you all for being here. Um, I originally come from Columbus, Indiana. Recently graduated from IU Bloomington uh, with a bachelor's in political science. Eventually, need a job, but uh, as of currently, I'm waiting when I'll start law school. So I've got a couple of years before that all needs to be settled out. So hopefully I can find something within that time. But again, yeah, if you have any questions, let me know. I didn't know you were waiting to go to the dark side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> join, the rest, join the few of us. That are, uh, let's give Paul Lagman a chance to say a few words. Paul, you, you want to speak on behalf of the congressman? Sure. Uh, just a couple of quick things. Um, uh, as you know, we passed the historic tax, uh, the historic tax cut. Um, this last uh, about a the last couple of weeks, and um, president's desk, it's been signed. Uh, but we're very excited about the potential economic impact that that's going to have. Uh, the congressman um, enthusiastically uh, supported that. There certainly are plenty of things within the bill that um, that may not be perfect, but. Uh, as we look back on the Reagan <coughs> tax cuts and the effect that that had on our economy, it is, um, we believe that a similar effect is coming. And so we're very excited about that. I'm happy to answer what questions I can. I will tell you that as the congressman is a is new, this is our first year, where we just passed our year in office, uh, and um, he's done a lot more listening than talking. And so that is one of the things that we try to, as a staff, emulate and so number one i'm happy to take questions number two um, uh, i will probably get the answer at a later time and then number three i will remind you too that down here uh at least once a month we have our casework staff uh here in portland they're helping here to help with medicare medicaid social security veterans benefits we regularly have our team uh here in portland and in jay county uh, to work with folks that um, just need help with federal agencies. And we work very closely with all our legislative um, members, our state legislative members. And in fact, we spent time with their staffs. As we have issues that are state related, uh, we pass them off to these guys so they can be helpful and uh, vice versa. And we really tried to streamline.
Thank you, Paul. Yeah, I appreciate you being here today. I brought a map along too because a lot of questions coming up about redistricting uh, because that's that's on the horizon for us when the when the census is done uh, in 2020. Then it will be up to the legislature to take that information that's been provided to us by the Census Bureau, and we will have to redraw lines for both uh, state house, state senate uh, lines for new districts. And so uh, I brought this along because we get a number of calls. And it's a lot uh, of calls we get uh, talking about redistricting that it needs to be fair. Uh, I brought this to show that what I think are as squared off lines as you possibly can get, uh, keeping in mind that every time you redistrict, you have to have that number of equal citizens in each district. Uh, when the Senate uh, drew our lines back in 2011, uh, we were within 0.1% of all the districts on that day that we knew the census, what it was going to be, within 0.1% of all of those districts being the same number of people. Uh, as you can guess, it's all computer generated. Uh, they can go township by township and tell how many Republican voters, how many Democrat voters, those as even as you can. But keep in mind, in a state, just for example, if you are a 60 40 state or 45 55 state, Republican, Democrat, regardless of who is in control, to draw lines to have a 50 50 representation because the state is not comprised that in that fashion. We do get some uh, squirrely, what I call squirrely districts, uh, even with what appears to me to be a very logical uh, sense here. This is Evansville. This is Indianapolis. This is Fort Wayne, where you see very small districts, Lake County, South Bend. And probably the most curious boundary is this boundary right here that you see this green that wraps around the purple. Uh, this is Jay County right here. This is Senate District 19. Uh, this includes Muncie and Anderson. And to be honest with you, it was done party in control of Muncie and Anderson. And to do that, we had to basically go around them, cut out a space for a Republican. Uh, had we split that, um, it may not be likely that you would have a Democrat part of the district and so a lot of give and take uh, and just remind you in 2011 we had no court case uh, nobody challenged and took us to court on Indiana's uh, redistricting plan so uh, we'll watch and see what happens we had a lot of discussion about going to an independent commission my opinion is an independent commission is appointed by politicians and they will not be independent. <laughs> uh, I think we have a constitution to do something different than we do it today because the constitution says it is the legislature's responsibility to draw the district lines for the federal districts and the house state districts. And so uh, there would have to be some changes to the Indiana Constitution uh, if the legislature is going to be cut out of the process because constitutionally uh, that's a requirement uh, of the legislature to draw those lines and to set those lines. So, Mr. Team, unless you have a question, but uh, Greg's eager to answer your questions. <laughs> well, of course. Now, the redistricting, when, when, do, when do we start that process? Well, the 2020 uh, will be the Census Bureau uh, census that's done, and then the 2021 uh, session will actually be uh, the redistricting legislation will have to be passed that year. And you won't be here. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. It might change your mind. Yeah, no. Jim? Uh, I have a question on the, uh, the workforce bill you're just talking about. Do you have any language in that council, and they're, they're going to decide before it comes to the local, I mean, the local has to basically apply to that council. Is that what it has to work? I mean, like, just say if Acker here in town wanted training money, they would have to go to that council first. 
I'm not sure it would be first gen, okay. but it would, for example, if they have to still do something. Yes, the company yeah. would go to the Indiana Economic Development Corporation, for example, they would make an award, but before that award is finalized, the council has to approve it. Okay. Is there anything in that language that ensures that money still comes to the border counties and it all don't go to the donut counties? Well, it's, it's always based on on the I understand that. I'm just saying the flow, the flow of projects. Yeah, and that's and that's part of our problem in rural right. areas is that we don't have as many projects. Um, those you always read about how there's Carmel and everywhere around the Indianapolis, lots of projects are happening there. We've got to get our workforce where we can make some of those projects happen here. And also. if they knew there was more training money available in the border counties. Then there might be more projects in the border counties. Yeah, one of, one of the things we can't get over <clears throat> is what we cannot um, find a good way yet to agree on a, some type of agreement of reciprocity. Uh, when you mention border counties, and Jim knows where you're at, whether you're in Portland or Union City, every employer employs about almost half of their workforce, and in some cases, are people from Ohio technically still don't incentivize businesses that employ Ohio residents. And that's purely a geographic, we've got to find a solution with the state of Ohio that says, we'll train your workers if you train ours and let's make sure they both get transferable skills so if one goes back to Indiana, one goes back to Ohio, it's good for both of us. So but that's part of our problem. Right. And it's the other states as well. I mean, it's, I mean, of course. it's all the board yeah. guys. I mean, if you... Is that we, the government, it's the utility, everything ends up there. So that's one reason why we don't have things, again, centered in the center of the state. Just a, a continuous fight uh, to push that out to the rest of the state. And I think Greg and I both would certainly agree on this that when we vote on legislation, we talk to folks about legislation. Our point of reference is not Indianapolis. Just I sometimes is voting Indianapolis. Uh, my frame of reference are places like Portland and Bryant and Geneva and Bluffton and Roanoke, Indiana and Ossian, Indiana. City. It's not about what takes place in in Indianapolis because that's not where I'm from. I live on seven acres out in the country in Wells County. My point of reference is what's best for my community there. So, uh, but it's a tough fight uh, all the time. But you're doing a lot of good things here. What Rusty's doing over with uh, advanced manufacturing uh, is, uh, I don't know any others like that in the state, unless there are, I don't know where they are. But uh, and if you don't know, we recently had the uh, Lieutenant Governor here to tour, and uh, she carried that message back, and she was <coughs> terribly impressed with uh, with what she saw there. She talked to me afterwards. <coughs> um, my name is Nick Miller. I'm the chairman of the Jay County Credit Prevention Coalition. A lot of emphasis, obviously, on drugs. Uh, it's pervasive across every sector of the community. Uh, we're uh, to do something about it. It's funding coming along with the efforts to uh, set up the regional uh, treatment centers, uh, the uh, opioid tracking through the pharmacies, other kinds of things that, that have impacted every community the same way. Uh, EMS, fire, uh, police, uh, obviously, and then a letter to the editor about the impact on uh, the uh, commercial industry sector and them participating in prevention and helping us, you know, get to where we need to go. Uh, we have a participation from other sectors. They've been impacted as much or more than anybody else. But we've seen very little, you know, uh, 
representation from that. So, but uh, anyway, <clears throat> money has to come along with a lot of these proposals. So. And it, it does take time, but, but Dick, uh, our dilemma here is that this isn't the budget session. So I think what this bill does is lay the groundwork, gets everything in the, let's develop this to the point where we're ready to spend money, and then it will have to be in 2019 is when money funds would have to be appropriated for that. The actual, the big dollars to make, to build those facilities or acquire existing facilities. Well, but, uh, I want to ask you a question. Sure. So over the past, uh, let's say, six to 12 months, have you noticed the stabilization in J, J County and the number of reports that you're having of addiction overdoses? Um, what we found is a lot of the uh, uh, sources are shifting to meth again, opioids, um, for a variety of reasons. We're not real sure yet. So. Statistics recently, I've been kind of a few months with my wife, but uh, um, we're having Yeah, and it's tough to get anything That's out of tough. those folks that that uh, are. They had, you have to pay your taxes. To deal with your... That's <laughs> right. That's right. That's right. So, yes, sir, Mayor. Yeah, um, Mayor McGee's in City Portland. Um, 
when I read this that you were uh, increasing funding for higher than expected enrollment, uh, the activities in town right. belong to the report that we got was 52 out of 92 counties have a decrease in population. So the problem is not increased enrollment with a lot of school corporations. It's in fact, our roots is, I think, in three counties, 7,000 every time the enrollment goes down, but people are having one or two children. Has there been any talk at all to help out school corporations that's going the other way, which is most of rural? Um, Randy, uh, to answer your question very bluntly, I would say that our policy on education and school funding, I don't see it changing at all in the next five to 10 years. Money will still continue to flow with the child. Uh, and the state has taken a very, in my opinion, has taken a very much a hands-off position. And that's not a concern here in Jay County, but in the terms of consolidation, uh, the state's not going to be the one to say, we want you to consolidate. We're going to force you to consolidate. We're going to help you consolidate. You need to consolidate. So what they do, what we're doing is basically trying to find a path that makes this almost mandatory on another front, which is on the financial or fiscal side. Uh, so, and, and Randy, this is simply addresses, yes, the school corporations, money flows with the child and if you have five more children than we anticipated you're you, the money's there to reimburse you for those and if you have fewer um, there's not much we can do about that but what, what we're seeing is is school corporations are against each other and you know last i knew at least 35 students from penville are now in southern wells so they got they, they you know they were that's what i don't want to see happen that's an issue. Uh, Southern Wells is in my district, and I think, well, all the school corporations around Southern Wells are not, are kind of ticked off about that whole issue with what the Southern Wells board has voted to do. Right. And if you're not aware, you're going to transport kids from outside the district into the district. Uh, I have folks who, on one side of that argument, say that's not fair. They shouldn't be doing that. I have folks on the other side saying that's school choice. If I decide I want my child to go to that school, there shouldn't be anything to prohibit that from, from happening. But that is happening in other places around the state. When I've talked to other members of my caucus to say, can you believe they're doing this? And they say, oh yeah, that's going on all the time in, in other places around the state. <coughs> it's a problem. It's just it's the first time I think it's sort of entered our footprint here in, in Northeast Indiana. So. Yes, sir. Oh, an issue with our schools also is that they're being asked to do more with less. Mm -hmm. Jay County has closed multiple schools now. They are constantly looking at better ways to go, but it's one school corporation for one county, and yet they're barely making it at this point. Really address that issue where they don't have to look at uh, these rifts, which may actually come at you know halfway through the school year. I know that was proposed at some point. Let me just say that there's an extremely good compare and contrast 33 and that's Jay County in Randolph County mm -hmm. now I will tell you that I believe your school corporation is taking the responsible position mm -hmm. of Based on population in Randolph County, I think and many of you have heard me say this before we're the poster child for how in this market and with money flowing with the child we're the poster child of how not to do education. And many of you have heard me say, uh, my school district where I live is Union Township Schools of Modoc, 73 students K through 12. And that was just in their last ADM. And many people have told me since September 15th, it's dropped to 150. To answer your question, in my opinion, when money flows with the child, that is exactly what has to happen to force school corporations, or at least the theory is to force school corporations to begin looking for partners. Because the only way you save money and meet budgets, make budgets meet is usually by closing buildings. And Jay County has taken that position and I, and I think it's the right <coughs> And Travis, I'll let you weigh in on no, this I, as well. I don't disagree. I have a, uh, a, a group of school superintendents every December where I call my school superintendents together. I've got 12 school districts in the 
the Senate district, too far off Greg having nine for a much smaller house district. Um, and I tell them, you have got to do things with more innovation than what you've ever done them before. Uh, for one thing, you've got to do it to keep and to attract folks to your school corporation. Uh, and the other is you've got to be able to save money. Uh, sharing buses, sharing uh, dietitians, sharing payroll, uh, a lot of the what we call back room kinds uh, and back office kinds of function that goes on in schools, those could be shared with other school corporations. But there's such territorialism, they don't want to give that up, they don't want to do that. And with online programs, uh, if you have a, if you need to have an advanced AP German class, uh, why does everybody have to hire a German teacher when you have one school corporation that could hire and the others uh, listen in by webcast uh, and everybody shares in that cost? some innovative things that we've not ever done before and I think that's one of the approaches and the, and the best part of that is I think you can do it for less money. I disagree but I do agree that the money needs to follow the child and if you're in a decreasing enrollment environment money but keep in mind that last session the legislature pumped in almost a half a billion dollars into local schools k-12 schools uh, and we've come back to say we're going to appropriate an additional $16 million to make up for the fact that we have an increasing enrollment in the state, which is the first time this has happened in a number of years, for that loss that schools are going to get because they had to share the dollars with more kids. Uh, granted, I think the net number is only like about 2,200 students uh, statewide. When you look at a million students, a little more than a million students, K-12, in the state of Indiana, 2,200 is not a large number, but it accounts for $16 million. And so we're going to do our best to replenish that so that school corporations get what we promised them uh, out of this last budget. So it's a tough question, no doubt, no doubt about it. Oh, oh sir, in the back here. Greg, you're talking about um, having the corporations go in and make, basically recruiting the high school, you know, is that, is that something? Giving them the opportunity to go ahead and recruit from the location. Yes. Okay. Is there is that state funded or is that going to have any money coming to help those corporations do that, or that's going to be the corporations do that it's all? Business. Well, the, this this is and again, keep in mind we're at the very early stages of the session. This could change. Outlined now, this would be on the part of the employer. Okay. There would be no funding required. It's just more or less schools. You have the option to allow one of your students. To to talk to an employer who wants to take the time, send an HR representative into the building and talk to multiple students. Well, I didn't know if there was some funding there because you talked about being innovative. I was a nice airport. You know, we started going down the aeronautical field with our school, with our students, and we just mm -hmm. operations to help us do that. Then, then we become attractive to somebody outside of our counties. And I want my son and daughter to go learn how to fly a plane. So. No. Yeah. I, I think you go out and look for uh, outside funding also. I had a school corporation in my district that came to me last year and said we would like to do an elementary STEM program, science, technology, engineering, and math, uh, in the elementary level. And they said, we don't have any money to do that. Can you help us out? So I went to, as interest statewide, a foundation. <laughs> And they said, yeah, we do. And I said, we need $10,000 to start this program. Went to a meeting with the president of the company uh, for Indiana. But I said, I want $10,000 for one of these schools for this program. And he said, I think we can get that for you. The news about two months ago, they did a check presentation to that school corporation uh, through the community foundation. Uh, of $10,000 to set up a STEM program for the elementary kids in that school. Uh, that's good for the school, but it's also a good uh, retention factor to keep families in that school. The problem is it was Southern Wells. So it's just more things they do to attract those kids from other schools to come to their school. It's 
it's a capitalist system in our public schools, folks, and it's dog fight, but I think you got to compete. Uh, you got to compete to win. Yes, ma'am. I have a question and a statement. Uh, money follows a student. Does that include homeschool children? They get we no have funding. a lot homeschool of homeschool children in J.K. Homeschools get no funding from the state. Right. They do. They do in a way because on the Indiana tax, get a credit on there. Right. So that it's indirectly, but they do right. on that. That's the only place. Scholarships, however, I think is it not? It's not for homeschools. Is oh, it's it for homeschool? I'll be glad to check into that part. So, uh, Another I thing. I appreciate <laughs> it. Uh, <laughs> but where the money opinion. goes and how much it's worth. So. Well, yeah, but you can, I mean, anybody, anybody that had, had privately, it's a private school or a home school, they can, there's, they can, there's an amount that they get a credit or a deduction for. I don't remember which it is. I mean, okay. we have very few. I mean, I would say our, Thousand clients, we have five. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Betty, um, you had a statement? Yes. Thank okay. you. I'm also with kids. <laughs> uh, what, what, what are your thoughts? Uh, I think we're all leaders on this issue this year. Can you go to another state? It's got it already. Be our state alone. Over there, get back. Well, what happens with the employers? Uh, what's going to happen with their drug tests? I mean, are they going to have to waive the, the person that's on the medical marijuana or? That's happening all over the country, so there's got to yeah. be. Yeah. It's already been looked at, I would think, as president. Why don't we do the same thing we did with alcohol? It used it used to be illegal, and then we taxed it, and then we legalized it because, you know, the CD, C, is a CBD <clears throat> medicine. Uh, I know personally several people that use it. And it helps, and it don't cost a thousand dollars to buy, so it don't have any THC in it. The THC is the problem. That's right. That's right. And uh, you know, we need the money. Let's tax it. I guess that would answer the employer. Yes, sir. Um, I find myself in two minds when it comes to this particular issue. Um, I can't say I'm for legalization for recreational use, but arguments being made for medical use. So let me give a personal example. When I was 15, I went through chemotherapy and radiation treatment for trauma. And the effects it had on my body, I do not want that to happen to anyone else. And if there is some limited use of marijuana to help alleviate those symptoms, I would be for that. Within the General Assembly, and it's my experience that the the groups that are the most vocal on the medical marijuana issue, uh, many many times, you're, we're hearing from veterans groups, and their members, you know, they have the post traumatic stress syndrome, they have they have pain, they have, and many of those folks have said, it keeps me off of painkillers. Can't we make this legal in our state? And and they. 
they're a, they're a group that has a lot of influence with many members of the legislature. You regulate it with the driving. I don't want to be driving down the road and have someone high. And I understand there's no test for it. So how on earth do you regulate it on your roads like you do alcohol? Yeah, yeah. Good point. Good point. Mm -hmm. I don't. We don't have the answer. No. And then <laughs> okay. you want to legalize it, and then you yeah. know okay. people are out of control on the road. It's sure. bad enough driving on the road without people being high. Well, so are cell phones, but yeah, we haven't done <laughs> We tried that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the medical marijuana is actually they they want to smoke a joint. Is that correct? So yeah, they want to smoke a joint. Is that correct? Or, how they, or is it is it oil? <laughs> what is yeah, multiple, well, multiple, multiple forms. Well, I mean, I, I guess I see, okay, when you get medical value out of smoking it, well, then you're now you're destroying your lungs out of that. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yes, sir. Uh, as far as the driving and so forth, Indiana's not going to be a leader in this. I mean, there's several states with it already, so they can model it after other states. If there is some medical, we wouldn't deny. <coughs> A medical technology and if there's a medicine even and maybe we shouldn't call it marijuana maybe we need to call it something else to alleviate but if there's something that is better and can help the, the veterans or anybody situation I don't know why as a state we would deny that uh, the people that's in that situation and again we're not like the guinea pig state I mean, as of now, so you're going to be able to model the legislation in the way that it can be. And the other thing is, as far as that goes, that's, uh, again, economics and money going out of our state to Michigan and Ohio, that if we had it here, then it would be another industry or whatever that would be. So. Well, I'm quite skeptical that it could work mm -hmm. because I... A business I do work for is located in Las Vegas, and uh, you drive down the interstate in Las Vegas, and about every fifth billboard, billboard for a clinic where you can go get a prescription uh, while you wait uh, for medical marijuana. Recently, you told me they were in California. Uh, in busy streets, there's a guy who dresses up in a green suit get you a prescription while you wait on the street <laughs> corner there are mobile offices of physicians who have been put out uh, and deployed around that will see patients on the street they pull up in a parking lot and open up their office in this mobile unit charge an outlandish price to get a prescription filled uh, for medical marijuana we have enough problems with 50,000 people dying on our highways from alcohol. So you Why do we would say you would legislate against that? Mm -hmm. I mean, when, I mean, if you know that's a problem, yeah. then when you did your legislation, you would have those that's are right. prohibited. And I know in Colorado, all the revenue they thought they were going to get from the sale of marijuana has not turned out to be what they thought it was. And that's recreation. Market is basically taking. Uh, the market away from the bona fide retailers uh, in the industry. So, all that works, it's just that I don't think it works. It's become a farce for recreational use uh, in most places around the country. But I don't want us to turn it into a police state right. to regulate. So, but. But are we going to open up Sunday sales? Probably. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, so, yeah, that's my point. Mm -hmm. yeah. One and one. One goes the same way as the other. I have a question on another thing. Are either one of the houses, have you addressed anything regarding the federal tax law for changes, how it's going to affect the state? Mm -hmm. Not that I'm aware. No, mm -hmm. the, only, the only thing we do uh, and I chair the Tax and Fiscal Committee, we will have an update from revenue to basically fall in line with federal tax. But basically because we use 
whatever line it, it flows through. It's a test of gross income. Flow. That's right. right. Flows through, through. Uh, that there. I mean, it's just like down on the federal level. I mean, there, there's still, I mean, I can just say that there's other states making adjustments. Of course, in my opinion, in the overall tax law, we in the Midwest won and the coast lost for the first time that has ever happened. I think that's a great thing. Absolutely. Except uh, Illinois. Yeah. Except Illinois. Well, they're, they're in their own spot. <laughs> uh, but along that line, and I did, I know you were the chairman of the, and I tell Greg this every time, our Indian Department of Revenue is a mess. It is far easier to deal with the federal anytime. And what, and you, <laughs> broke, you both brought up funding. The Indian Department of Revenue has to be your most important thing because that's where your income is. I mean, any business person, you've got to address your income and then you also reduce expenses. But the income, it's just a mess. And the one thing is, is just like, and I'm sure you're aware of this, but office manager, um, the head of the Department of Revenue come to Muncie, he comes every year she, she wants a meeting because I get tired of going to those and she asked about the computer system for the Department of Revenue Not up to date in seven years <laughs> and so you know it, it is, it when, is when was that that they said that in October no no we gave them funding last year to update their system that hasn't been updated for like 17 years and right. it's okay. in the process but he right it's in the process, but he was saying it was going to be seven years. That's what she told me. I, and I, it well, didn't sound right, but I'm glad that to hear the, you say that. The worst thing is there, one of the worst things with the state in this, and I can talk to you a second there, but the, uh, is you have an issue, and you, and you, if I call in, I talk to Bob. I call back, I have to talk to Mary, and I can't just get one person to handle it. If I really if I want something handled, I have to drive to Muncie and talk to those ladies there. And they're very nice over there. That Muncie office is excellent. But you should go to one of the revenue offices and just sit there for the day and hear the people that come in and what they don't like you to do. Um, the IRS agent in Muncie. She went there to pay her taxes and she wanted to leave a check for somebody else because she wasn't that person. She wasn't allowed to do that. She didn't have power of attorney to do it. Again, it's the, it's the federal employee that cannot do that. Okay. And anybody, I mean, and I've been over there when did not sign something for Mr. Jones. At the very least, and coming into the budget year the next year, I think both houses need study committees and really review that department because we have a new person in the DOR in the Department of Revenue. Uh, two weeks ago, he's so new he doesn't even have business cards yet. Okay, uh, if you send me send me an email with all of those issues, I give me no, ten. I'll say, okay. okay. I'll say, uh, I it down to long sentences. I will, meet with, <laughs> I will meet with him and we'll talk about those issues. Uh, but some of the things they're doing with legislation <laughs> this year is going to streamline that I've heard about that people go th through with the Department of Revenue because you're right, they have the worst, one of the worst reputations. The kind of style. And that's where your money comes in. So, that's you right. know, you, you yeah. got, that's, and when you talk about this funding, we're going to get $16 million, but we got money out here that is or isn't collect. And I think you, they, I, in my opinion, I would think the Indian Department of Revenue shows more receivables than they actually have because if you fail to file your sales tax for one,
summary and it's on Texas. And uh, SB 261, SB 268, SB 171, House Bill 1033, and SB 129. We, we have figures that show only 6% of the annexations are even remonstered. And I get, I get asked over the last three or four years, certain pockets around Portland, because we have over 250 people outside the city limits that are getting city services, pursue that. You guys are so far against it. Now, I know there's mayors that's been abusing it, and that's what's. Can we do a happy medium on that? I haven't seen any of those bills come through. I don't know what's going to happen with those. Uh, but annexation is a thorny issue <coughs> because people in the country are basically pitted against the mayor and city councils and, and town boards. And so, uh, and I, and I'm, it's a I, tough I, issue. I don't, if, a, if, a, if a mayor is trying to do land grab on farmers, I'm 100% I'm with you. But there's a lot of other cases that that's not the, not I, the case. I hear you. I hear you. I will be back in uh, Jay County and Greg Will on oh, sure. what is the date, Barry? February 3rd. February 3rd. Uh, Farm Bureau is hosting a uh, tool shed meeting. So uh, if you have any connection to, to uh, Farm Bureau or you want to join between now and that date, uh, Barry will take your money uh, to be invited to, uh, to that meeting as well. So we will be back. This will be the last and only one that I can do here because I've got a limited calendar in a short session and I've got a big district. So uh, I'll be out and around. I, next week I'll be in Marion actually uh, for, the, for their third house. So. Yep. Thank you all for being here today. Yeah. Hey, we, we did bring you some entertainment on the way out. Travis and I both brought those, the big posters that have all of our pictures on them. When I say it's entertainment, you just put that on a board and you start throwing darts at them. So. <laughs> See if you can hit us. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, very good. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Don't forget to pick up a poster out here if you want to take one back for your office or wherever mayor. Uh, some of you that work in a public office, we get it for you to have one of those. So, okay. Oh, thank you. Great. You know what? We're coming out. I'm doing one thing that I'll mention. Uh, for those of you who are small businesses, on uh, uh, January 25th uh, in Fort Wayne, we're hosting a doing business with the federal government um, uh, event. Include a number of state and federal agencies, quite a few state agencies, as a matter of fact.